Thanks, Beth. It's good to be able to say thanks, Beth, again. Uh, if y'all haven't been here, and she's been out a month, right? She's been sick, so it's good to see her back. I know uh, Chris is appreciative of that, too. He filled in for us, so we're, we're thankful for him, and Carolyn filled in one time for us as well. So, But we're glad to see Beth back over there playing, and she keeps me on track because I, I can be long-winded. I start, start talking about something, and she stops playing. That lets me know, it, hey, it, it's time to come up here and start. So thanks. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. And we want to welcome everybody to, uh, here to First Baptist Church. Shelman, it is a beautiful day outside. And it is a beautiful day, as always, rain or shine, to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, really, you can look through your bulletin, but I won't have you open them this morning. Uh, the, I just want to announce a couple of things. I've already announced our, our welcome back to Beth. I want to give a big thanks to Robert and Kyle. They've been working the last two weeks. If you had the opportunity to watch online or weren't here and you watched online, um, you noticed that you were pretty much just looking at the stained glass window. Now, that's a beautiful stained glass window, and there's a lot of benefits to looking at that rather than me, but most people like to see the service going on. But they said the sound was good, so Robert and Kyle have really worked hard on that, and I think they got it back going. Plus, they got a couple other little special treats in there for, for people as well as they're learning the system. So, uh, And then the last thing is, of course, the flowers back here. Uh, and I had it down pat what they were. Uh, hydrangea, woodland hydrangea, that's what they are. Uh, so I, I don't know anything about plants, so y'all have to forgive me. But they are beautiful. Miss Ann Bynum uh, placed them for us for our enjoyment today, and we're thankful for that uh, to woodland Hydrangea, if I said that right. Well, without it, any further ado, Romans 11:36 at the top of your bulletin there in the back says, "For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory." Amen. Did you come here today to glorify the Lord? I hope so. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for a beautiful day that reminds us of, of your. Uh, your, your glory, of your, your wonder, Lord. We pray that you would turn our hearts toward you this morning, that we would praise you and worship you with our hearts and our minds and our, our strength, Lord, as we do it in, in song and through prayer and through your word. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, thank you all for your prayers and support, your texts. It's been a rough month for Chuck and I, so... Um, but I do thank Chris for filling in with me and for me and Carolyn. That was very appreciative. So thank you all so much. It's great to be a part of your family. So um, we're going to start with number three in your hymnal. It's worthy of worship. In Revelations 4.11 it says you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. So we're going to start with number three, worthy of worship. And then we'll turn to number 58 like a river glorious. So please stand as we sing.
today. A reading from God's Word is going to be Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. In your pew hymnal, that'll be on page 721. 721. God's Word says, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one else besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness, and let the earth open up, and salvation bear fruit, and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessel of the earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Woe to him who has said to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me about the things to come concerning my sons and you shall commit to me the work of my hands. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands and ordained all their hosts. I have aroused him in righteousness and I, ha I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city and will let my exiles go free without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, will come over to you and will be yours. They will walk behind you. They will come over in chains and will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you. Surely God is with you and there is none else, no other God. Truly you are a God who hides himself. O God of Israel, Savior, they will be put to shame and humiliated, all of them. The manufacturers of idols will go away together in humiliation. Israel has been saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will not put to shame or humiliate to all eternity. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and he did not create it a waste place but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say of the offspring of Jacob, seek me in waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. Gather yourselves and come. Draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? It is not I. Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am the God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say to me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who were angry at him will be put to shame. And the Lord, all the offspring of Israel, will be justified and will glory. Well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to read a prayer from an old Puritan prayer book. I think it's fitting. 
But let's go to the Lord in prayer. O Thou Most High, Creator of the ends of the earth, the Governor of the universe, Judge all men, Head of the church, Savior of sinners, Thy greatness is unsearchable, Thy goodness is infinite, Thy compassion is unfailing, Thy providence is boundless, Thy mercies are ever new. We bless Thee for the words of salvation. How important, suitable, encouraging are the doctrines, the promises, and the invitations of the gospel of peace. We are lost, but it, it is in Thou hast presented to us a full, free, and eternal salvation. Weak, but here we learn that help is found in one that is mighty. Poor, but in him we discover unsearchable riches. Blind, but we find he has treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We thank thee for thy unspeakable gift. Thy son is our refuge, foundation, hope, and confidence. We depend on his death, rest in his righteousness, and desire to bear his image. May his glory fill our minds, his love reign in our affections, his cross inflame us with zeal. Let us, as Christians, fill our various situations in life, escape the snares to which they expose us, discharge the duties that arise from our circumstances, enjoy with moderation their advantages, improve with diligence their usefulness. And may every place and company we are in be benefited by us. Amen. Beth. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to the very first chapter of the very first book in God's Word, and that's Genesis chapter 1. As we continue our study in Genesis, as we continue, as I've entitled the overall study, strengthening our foundations, our foundations which are found in Genesis 1 through 11, chapters 11 in particular. If you were here last week, uh, we started the days of creation. We did days one through three, and the Bible is very clear, as I said last week, that yes, I do believe these are 24-hour literal days. I think to draw anything else is to go outside of what Scripture says. To put any other time frame on the days of creation would be to go outside of Scripture, and that indeed is dangerous. To clarify, God gave us certain endings to every day. If you recall last week, he ends every day with it, and there was an evening, and there was a morning, one day. And there was an evening, and there was a morning, a second day. And there was an evening, and there was a morning, 
a third day. You know, it's almost like God knew. It's almost like God knew that some 6,000 years later that people would question how he created the earth. Interesting, isn't it? God could have created the earth in six minutes. God could have created everything in six seconds. That's why I find it so interesting that Christians don't believe. So many Christians are not believing what God's Word says. Friends, I get that believers deny it. I understand that evolutionists and atheists deny that God created. They deny God altogether. I understand that. I don't understand people who profess to be Christians doing it. Atheists, non-believers, and evolutionists, whatever they want to call themselves, naturalists, that's their starting point. That's their presupposition. A presupposition is to suppose something from the beginning. That is to make an uh, assumption about something. Friends, as we've talked about before, that is their belief. That is their, their faith. This is not really a, a battle. Genesis, that is. Genesis is not really a battle over uh, science versus religion. It's not even really a battle between evolutionists and creationists. It's a spiritual battle. It's a battle of faith. It's a battle of belief. Atheists, evolutionists have a presupposition, as I told you. They assume, they suppose, the first thing they assume, they suppose, is that there is no God. And friends, if that's your assumption, if that's what you're coming to the table with, then guess what the second assumption is? If there is no God, there can be no miracles. And if there is no God and there is no miracles, then you have to fill in the blank. You have to answer all the questions through a naturalistic point of view. Everything came together by a natural process. I hope you understand, as I've mentioned several times, that friends, this is faith, this is belief, but this is not belief in the eternal God, this is the belief in the creation man. This is belief not in God's wisdom, but in man's wisdom. Do not fool yourself that this is about the intellect of man and, and, and the science proves this and, and the rest is religion and faith. Friends, they're both based on faith, as I've said before. They're both based on belief. It's just which one are you going to believe? The wisdom of man or the wisdom of God? I, your pastor, Brad Savage, I readily admit that I have a presupposition. And I encourage you, as a child of God, to have a presupposition as well. I do not deny it. My first presupposition is, there is a God. That's a good place to start, right? Isn't that the Word of God says that's the beginning of wisdom? There is a God. He is revealed to us in His Word. His Word is true, in that infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. I, I hope you understand that. His Word says that He created everything in six days, six literal days. His Word said He sustains everything by His might and by His power. His Word says He controls everything. And friends, one day His Word says He's coming back. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Which part are you going to start throwing out? Well, I like the part about him coming back and him saving me, but I can't believe the rest of it. Well, if you can't believe the first part of it, I have a hard time believing you believe the rest of it. There are miracles when God chooses to intervene in his creation. I don't understand why that's difficult to believe. Genesis 1, 1 is correct, and it is in the beginning. God created everything out of nothing. What else can he do? What else can he not do? Miracles are throughout Scripture, and you have to start throwing out everything if you're going to start throwing out miracles. From creation to the red parting of the Red Sea to the great flood to Jonah and the great fish, 
There's many others in the Old Testament. I don't have time to list. To the virgin birth. You, you do realize the virgin birth is a miracle, right? To the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the foundation of our faith. They're all miracles. But can I tell you what your biggest presupposition as a believer ought to be? Well, let me let the Bible say it for me. Let God be found true, though every man is a liar. Did you hear that? Let God be found true, though every man is a liar. You mean to tell me, Brother Brad, that scientists would lie to us? Yes. Is that, is that hard to believe? If their presupposition is there is no God, do you think they won't lie to you? I don't know where you've been. Because in my life, I've noticed people like to lie. But why do they lie? Again, let's let God's word answer that. John 8, 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Your father's the devil. If you're not a believer, I hope you understand that. That's what God's word says. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And friends, can I tell you, there is no greater lie than there's ever been than the lie of evolution. People lie because they're like their father, their devil. People sin because they're like their father, the devil. People deny the glorious works of God because they're like their father, the devil. And people refuse to believe because they bought the lie of the father, their father, the devil. And there's only one way to disown that father that we're born into, that way of life and sin and death, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, I don't deny that I have presuppositions. I don't deny that we live by faith. That's what Scripture tells us we're supposed to live by. I believe the battle starts here in the beginning, in Genesis. It's my hope that as we go through Genesis 1 through 11, and we've already started it for a few weeks, it's my hope that this challenges you. I hope that it makes you uncomfortable, to be honest. I hope it makes you start questioning yourself. Am I trusting God, or am I trusting man? Am I believing what God says, or am I believing what man is telling me? It is my hope that the foundations of your faith will be strengthened. By this study, it is my hope that we'll walk away proclaiming just like the Apostle Paul. Let God be true, though every man be a liar. Let God be true, though every man be a liar. Days 1 through 3, we saw what? We saw God ordering creation. I won't go back to it. If you missed it, it's online. Knock yourself out. You go back and listen to it. But God ordered creation. And today what we're going to see is God filling creation. God is filling creation. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 23. I know it says 25, but I'm only going to get through the first two points today. 14 through 23. God's word says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let there be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens and give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. He placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth and the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful 
and multiply, and fill the waters of, in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Let us pray. Lord, you are a glorious God. You are the creator, God, Lord. Lord, I pray this morning that you would grant belief to those who do not believe. That you would be glorified in that faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're on day four. And day four, you see in your notes, God filled creation with lights. God filled creation with lights. Just like he did the other days, he, he has the same modus of operation. He started off with, then God said. God speaks it, and it's so. God speaks it, and it happens. We've already seen that he spoke into existence the light, the expanse, the dry land by separating the seas. That's in verse 9. And then the vegetation at the end of day 3 as well. You know, it's almost like God was preparing the earth for something, isn't it? It's almost like he was designing the earth to do exactly what it's doing now. It's almost like he knew what he was doing. It's almost like he's the sovereign Lord and God of the universe that created all things. And that's exactly what God was doing. He was preparing the earth to fill. He was preparing the earth to fill the earth. To fill it with what? Well, we just read it. Some of them. Look at verse uh, 14. The first thing we see is in God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. Well, those of you who are full awake the last couple of weeks are, are going to be saying, but he already created the light, right? That's way back in the verse 3. That was the first thing he did. No, friends, he said back then, and I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, he said, let there be light. And we talked about that. What is that light? I firmly believe that light is the glory of God because the revelations tell us in the new heaven and the new earth there will be no need for the sun because the glory of God will illuminate everything. And I think that's what happened in the beginning on the first day. But here he says, let there be lights with an S, in the expanse of the heavens, out there, past the atmosphere. Let there be lights. The Hebrew term there really means light givers. They give light off. That's what it means. What were the lights? Look at verse 16. There was the greater light that governed the day. We don't have to be an astronomer. I can't even say it. Astronomer to figure that out, right? The greater light is the sun. The lesser light to govern the night, that's the moon. And then what does he say at the end of verse 16? And he made the stars also, all of them. Now let's look at these individually, at this massive work of creation. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Did you know the sun, I'm going to have to read this because I don't know this off the top of my head, is 865,000 miles in diameter. That's pretty big. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's 109 times larger than the planet Earth. The sun radiates light. I guess we all understand that. We go outside, we see the light, we can even feel the warmth. Especially as summer comes, we feel even more and more of it. Yet the sun is far less complex in its makeup than the Earth is. It's almost like it was put there for a reason, right? The sun is essential for life on earth. Everybody agrees with that, right? The sun is essential for life on earth. If it was any closer, it would destroy all life. If it was any further away, it would do the same. Well, let's look at the moon. The moon is much closer to us. The moon does not radiate light. Well, Right there, people say, see, the Bible's wrong. The Bible said the moon gave light, the lesser gives light. Well, friends, from our perspective, at night, the moon does give light, right? It's not wrong. It is a giver of light. It just doesn't radiate it. It reflects light. The sun is the source of light. The moon reflects it by night, just like it says. You know, in fact, in ancient times, People actually considered the moon the greater light because when they looked up in the sky, it was bigger than the sun. 
by their perspective, but that's a different story to chase. I can't help but chase this rabbit. Doesn't that remind you of what you're supposed to be like in Christ? As a believer, a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are not the light. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. But you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to reflect the light. You're supposed to reflect the light where? In darkness. We're just like the moon. Now I'm going to offend some people with this, but that's all right, I guess. We're just like the moon. We're lifeless, lightless, and dead. A big dead rock. And without the sun reflecting on us, without the light of Christ reflecting on us, without the light of Christ giving us life, we would be just like the moon. I'll leave it there. Jesus told us, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The moon also is essential for life on earth. There's many examples of that, and I won't go into it. But we know that to be true. Then he goes on to say, he made the stars also. When I think of the stars, one word comes to mind. It's awesome. Don't y'all love a clear night? You go out and look at the stars. You know, by the human eye, it's estimated that if you really stood out there and counted this much, you can, might could see 3,000 to 5,000 stars. That's a lot of stars. Even I could count that high. In 1921, astronomers estimated that there were 300 billion stars in the universe. That was before the Hubble telescope and other technologies. Now, astronomers have given up trying to number the stars in creation. Let me translate that for you. Astronomers are starting to agree with God's word, what it's told them all along. In Genesis 22, 17, God is talking to Abraham, Abraham and he says to him, Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars in the heavens. Now, if, if we were just going by what we can count, that's not very many, right? So obviously the creator knows what he's talking about. The stars in heaven, and then he compares it to what? As to the sand which is on the seashore. Now, have you ever tried to count the sand on the seashore? I think it goes without saying. God knew what he was doing when he wrote the book. God knew what he was doing when he spoke it into existence. But let me tell you, there's something a little more exciting than that to me. Psalm 147.4 says, God, He, being God, counts the number of stars. He gives names to all of them. God not only created the stars, he knows the stars. Why is that exciting? That should be exciting to you. It says he gave them names because believer, the same God who said, let there be lights and created the sun, the moon, and the stars, all of them, in an instant, by the way, it's the same God who says, if you believe in me, if you trust in me, I know you. I know you by name. I care for you. That ought to be exciting to us as believers. Well, what's the purpose of the light? Let's go through that real quick. We can see it in 14. The first purpose is to separate day from night. Light from darkness, we get that. In the, in the daytime, the sun comes up, the, the darkness goes away. At nighttime, the sun goes away, it's now dark. The second point is, it says there in 14 as well, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, let's not overcomplicate this. What does this sound like? This sounds like God created something in order. This sounds like God was creating seasons. This sounds like God was making a calendar, right? Why? Well, we get the answer right there in 15. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth. You know, it's like God was preparing the earth for something, isn't it? It's like he was getting it ready for something. And indeed he was. In verses 18 and 19, he goes on to say, And to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And if God says something is good, that means it's perfect without error, without blemish of any kind. And then he goes on to say in 19, There was evening and there was 
morning, the fourth day, and as I went over this a lot last week, if you have an evening and you have a morning, what do you have? A day, and in this case, you have the fourth day. Let's move right along to day five. God filled the creation with fish and fowl. Fish and fowl, see that? How that went together, that's why I put them there. God filled creation with fish and fowl in 23, uh, verses 20 through 23. After day, uh, after day four, guess what the earth was ready for? It was ready for life. It was ready for life. We see the first mention of life in Scripture is found there in verse 20 and then 21. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. First time in Scripture life is mentioned. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, I thought he already made the vegetation. Well, there's a distinction here because the word here in Hebrew for this word of life means one with a soul, means one with a consciousness. Now we know plants don't have consciousness, but we know that animals have that, the blood running through them. They have a consciousness about them. They're not human. We'll get to that on day six. But that is life living creatures. After day four, the earth is ready for life. Now, what kind of life did he put there on day five? Well, look here in verse 20. I just read some of them. The first thing we see is living creatures in the water. That's in verse 20, I think. He said, let waters teem with swarms of living creatures. In the water. Now, what creatures mostly live in the water? Fish, fish, and more fish, right? You know, Dr. Seuss was right. Wait, can I talk about Dr. Seuss anymore, or is that against, against the regulation? No. Dr. Seuss was right. One of my favorite things, I like to read this one to the kids, is one fish, two fish. Red fish, blue fish. Right? Y'all remember that one? Big fish, small fish. All types of fish. They tell us there's upward of 9,000 species of fish in the waters on this earth. That's that we know of. My expertise is on the small fish because that's apparently all I could catch. But not just fish, really. This is all-inclusive. All things that live in the water. All things that live in the water were created during this time. Second, we see the birds. Really, the word here, as I, as I said in the, in the title, or in the point there, is really fowl, which means flying thing. So again, this isn't just birds, but it includes all flying things here. But Chuck is, Chuck is quick, because the first sermon I did on Genesis, he got the answer to this one real fast. But we are finally to the answer to the question that you've all been waiting for, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? Right after the first sermon on Genesis, Chuck came up with the answer, so he gets the gold star for everybody. Thanks, Chuck. Well, let me tell you that that question in itself is evolutionary. If you read and you believe the Bible, you already know the answer. The chicken came first, okay? The chicken came first, just like all of creation and every other creature, God created everything fully grown and fully mature, fully ready to function for his main purpose, which we're getting to on day six, right? Friends, I hope you look at this and you read this and you agree with me that there is no room in the word of God for evolution. In fact, there is no need for evolution in the word of God. God does not need an evolutionary process. God does not need random chance and God certainly didn't make the survival of the fittest to bring us to where we are. In fact, God's word says quite the contrary. God spoke it, and it was. God spoke it, and they were fully grown, fully functional, fully in place. And yes, not to get all complicated, the stars way out a gazillion billion miles away were fully there, and so was the light that got here too. 
I don't understand the complication of that. If God can create all things out of nothing, he can create all that stuff in between as well. Evolution, chance, and survival of the fittest is only needed and only imposed when you presuppose there is no God. When you have to fill in the blanks. John MacArthur has said they are biblically, blindly, not biblically, I almost got that one wrong. They are blindly devoted to chance because they do not want to, more, to be morally accountable to a personal and holy creator. I think that cuts right to the chase, right? But friends, there is a God, and the Word of God says that in verse 20, it says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And then verse 21 goes on and says, God created great sea monsters as well, and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind and God saw that it was good. Sea monsters here, the old King James says great whales which is really not the best translation. I like the King James pretty good but that's not a great tra translation. Great sea monsters means all and every big creature that's in the oceans, that's in the waters. The, the Hebrew word here is actually the word most common used for dragon. Now we'll go off on this one a little bit just because I find it a little interesting. Dragons are interesting, right? Who didn't grow up liking dragons? We all like dragons, right? It looks like a dinosaur to me. How about y'all? Yet scientists, you know, you remember those ones who presume there is no God in the first place and that the Bible is not true. They tell us that dragons were myths and legends. Yet on every continent, now get this now, every continent there are stories, drawings, and artworks, not only of dragons, but of dinosaurs. Now I find that fascinating. Just some rational thought here. How do people draw pictures of dragons and dinosaurs if they never saw them? If we didn't start excavating them to about 100 years ago, how did people that lived 600 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years ago draw pictures of dinosaurs, make artwork of dinosaurs? I'll leave you that to chew on, but might I suggest to you that the Bible is true, and it is. Therefore, that the people and the dinosaurs, including what might be called a dragon, live side by side together. Verse number four, I mean not verse four, point, the fourth thing we see is every living creature that moves in the water. Well, that pretty much care, covers everything else, right? Anything that lives in the water from the smallest thing we can't see to the largest thing God created on day five. Now I want us to focus real quick on something that's very important here. It says they swarmed after their kind in verse 21, and every winged bird after its kind. You know, that's not insignificant right there. Creation and evolution do not mix. Can I tell you there's not one piece of evidence that one kind has moved from one kind to another? Not one piece. Evolution is submitted as well. I'm not saying something that's just uh, out of blind faith, although, as I admit, I don't have a problem with that. Evolution is, in fact, the definition is one kind moving to another kind, and yet we don't see it. We don't see it in the fossil records, and we don't see it in person. The fact is, the evidence points to design, and design points to intelligence, and intelligence points to a creator. All of that points to that God's word is correct and should be believed. Let's talk about DNA just for a second. DNA ought to prove evolution, right? But in fact, it does the opposite. DNA, just in a nutshell, contains the information that enables organisms to reproduce, preserve, and repair itself. DNA tells the organism the genetic structure that it's to have 
limits the organism, it can't go more and it can't go less. Friends, that's quite the opposite of what evolution teaches us, right? DNA says what God has already said, that everything that is on earth has to reproduce after its kind. And I don't care if all of society says you could choose what kind you want to be, the Word of God says you're after your kind. And if I wake up tomorrow morning and want to be a chimpanzee, please tell me that I'm not, because I'm not. God's Word says that you are made human, created in His image. Variations happen, but no change. We understand that. You understand that, right? Within every kind, there are variations. God is the creator God. God is magnificent. God is glorious. Look at the creation. You would expect God to be creative too, right? And he is. Look around. Look around you, all around you today. Every person on this earth is a shade of brown. Now, I'm not going to go into the technical thing of that because it's above my pay grade. But we're all shades of brown. Some of us are a lot lighter than others. Some are darker. We have various hair colors. Look around. Everybody's got different hair colors. Some of us are losing our hair. We're all different heights. We're all different weights. Some people have big eyes and little eyes, medium eyes, big noses, little noses, big feet, small feet. Right? These are all variations. We see that in the animal kingdom as well. No two creations are exactly right. Alike, there are variations within the creation, within the kind, but every kind is still its kind, just like God said. Let me encourage you to let God be true, though every man is a liar. And then it goes on to say, and this is the final point here, that God blessed them. God bless them. Look at 22. It said, God bless them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Yeah, that's the first time God blessed anything, too. The first time he blessed anything in Scripture was right there. You know, his blessings are consistent throughout Scripture. They, they include a charge, a, a command, so to speak. When he wants you to be blessed, he also wants you to obey something. And what does he say right then? He tells them to be fruitful and to multiply. The rest of creation doesn't have a problem with obeying what God created them to do. It's only humans that do. In today's world, though, in today's churches, we, we make the word blessing to be synonymous with health, wealth, and prosperity. And, and yeah, you know, it is good that we have those. We want to be able to pay bills and do things like that. There's nothing wrong with them in particular. But just because you're wealthy certainly doesn't mean you're blessed by God. Right? God's blessings always consist, just like they do here, fruit and multiplication. That's in your life. That's in this church. If you are a born-again child of God, you are still called to be fruitful and multiply. Not just with kids, obviously, although he does tell them that later. But be fruitful and multiply. Be the reflector of Christ that you're supposed to be. Multiply Christ by proclaiming Christ unashamedly, boldly. Point to the truth of God's word. But you know, you could only be blessed by God, you could only be fruitful by God, and you could only multiply saints for God by proclaiming His Word if you are His. If you are a believer. And that, friends, is the greatest blessing we could ever have. We could be dead broke and dying, but if we're a believer, we're blessed by God, and we could be wealthy and thriving, but if we're not, then we're not blessed by God. I hope you understand the difference, and I hope you strive for a true blessing of God, and confess your need, confess your sins, repent of your sins, and trust Jesus Christ as Lord, for there's no other way. That's what the Word of God tells us, unless that's the part that maybe you've thrown out that you don't believe. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. I thank you for your truth. There is no doubt 
that Genesis is under attack and has been under attack for quite some time. There is no doubt that people of faith who, who believe the word of God will be mocked and ridiculed and made fun of. But Lord, let us believe your word rather than man's word. Let us trust you rather than man. Let us glorify you rather than man trusting all things into your hands. Lord, I pray that if you're moving in the hearts and minds of someone today, and they recognize that they don't know you, that they don't believe you, that they do not have faith in you, that you would draw them to a decision of faith and trust in you, forsaking all else and coming to you, who gave all on the cross because we could not give it. If they have any questions, let them come forth or grab me afterward. Lord, may you be glorified in our lives, not only today, but throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.